Thank you all for coming on this rainy Monday evening. Uh, and to begin our evening together, I would like to introduce Monsignor Edward Green, who will uh, share a thoughtful reflection, a prayerful reflection with us to set the tone for the evening. Monsignor. One of the things which I've learned through many years in the parish and celebrating weddings, and frequently you can see the heads, um, if you ask different people to do this briefly, who's that, who's that, why they ask her, why they ask him, who's that? It becomes a distraction. So just briefly to kind of explain the background of this program, and then a brief uh, expression of our hopes for it. Because very briefly, uh, Georgiana um, went to St. Joseph's College quite a few years ago. <laughs> and my sister was a couple of years after that. At that time, it was a wonderful experience for them. And at that time, it was St. Joseph's College for women, no men. And it was also a very, very strong Catholic tradition there were a number of priests on the faculty and a lot of nuns, and you could tell them went to heaven. And so in the many, many years since then, a lot of things have changed. In fact, I think at the present time, I don't think there are too many teachers anymore who begin by telling the class, please turn off your cell phone so we get on with the class. I mean, they didn't do that when these girls went to college a few years ago. But Georgiana and my sister have been, well, fellow alumni for many years, fellow teachers, New York City public school system. If any of you are thinking of going into teaching, they'll both tell you they got a wonderful grounding and preparation for it in St. Joseph's College, and they did very, very well. And so all of that was very, very appropriate. But Georgiana, after having graduated and taught for many years, ended up marrying a wonderful fellow, uh, Risa Khatib. And they didn't have any family, but they have been friends to many, many people, including Irene and I. And so it has been a wonderful, wonderful thing to have enjoyed their friendship for many, many years. And at this stage of their life, we like to give thanks for the things that have happened in our lives. In fact, I think the older we are, the more we realize there are many more years to be thankful for. But Georgiana and Risa have contributed together, preparing some things which would be helpful in the Islamic tradition in Iran, where Risa came from, and for St. Joseph's College here, where Georgiana came from. I think that's enough background. And as far as an invocation, I think appropriate it would be simply to say, let us pause for a moment I think it is an appropriate thing. It's an appropriate thing for young Catholic people to learn, to learn more about their faith. What does their religion really say? And the same thing for people from an Islamic background. Appreciate what does the background really think? What are the important things? What are the appropriate things? So I think the only thing that my invocation would be, take a moment, express that people pray for the gift of wisdom to understand the most important and beautiful of each of the traditions, how they will help people to live together in the world that we believe God has created. And we ask this as we ask all things through God's blessing and help, especially in this particular evening and for the semester and the year ahead. God bless. Thank you very much, Monsignor. That was, as ever, very beautiful. Uh, I am Sister Elizabeth Hill. I am the president of St. Joseph's College at this time, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this second Khatib Lecture. I want to thank you for coming out on this not-too-spring-like evening. Uh, we tried to extend the beautiful weather of the weekend, but we didn't quite make it. But I can assure you, that when it's all over, you will be glad you made the effort to be here despite the weather. Now, before I introduce our distinguished guest speaker, I want to pick up on a little bit of what Monsignor Breen just spoke about 
and that is about Georgie and Riza. Um, we are so blessed to have them as our friends because without their generous and enthusiastic support, none of us would be here tonight. Uh, Risa and Georgie, really it is because of you and because of your interest in providing our students and indeed the entire college community and our neighbors with the opportunity to listen to, to share with, and to learn from scholars in a variety of religious traditions that we have been able to benefit from the presence of Dr. Pedron during this past semester and of course from the Imam last spring. For those of you who don't know them, I wish you did. They're very special people. Dr. and Mrs. Riza Khatib represent in a very real sense, and this again follows up on what Monsignor Breen said, the ideal that the Khatib chair seeks to, rep to present to our students. That is, they come really from two different traditions. One Muslim from Iran, one Roman Catholic from Brooklyn. And they have blended those traditions into a harmonious union that envelops not only their own relationship, but their relationship with their families and friends, indeed all whom they meet. It is their hope, and certainly ours by extension, that providing opportunities for the St. Joseph's College community to be enriched through challenging academic experiences in the classroom, as well as through informal exchanges in small groups, seminars, and conversations, that a greater understanding and appreciation of other backgrounds, faiths, and cultures will develop. And that will, of course, serve our students well as they find their way into an increasingly multicultural world and as they seek to help create a new, more united humanity. Risa and Georgie, we can't thank you enough. And I only hope that you know how much we appreciate your gift, your presence, and the challenge that you have given us. And I promise that we will continue to strive to honor your intentions with each Khatib scholar in the years to come. And I would like you to please stand so we can honor and, re and go ahead, come on, stand up. You can do this. Come on, come on, come on. extraordinary people and I, I've been very blessed by their friendship and uh, I consider it one of the, the greatest blessings of my life so thank you and now it is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker now all too often in, in introducing lecturers here in this country the adjective distinguished is tossed around with little regard for any fundamental justification or basis and tonight however I am happy to say is different Tonight, we have a truly distinguished guest. In fact, her resume goes on for 21 pages. And I can tell you from having looked at it carefully, there's not one light or fluffy item on any one of those pages. You know, sometimes you sort of like see people who've like padded it. No, no padding. This is straight stuff. Dr. Margot Bedran is currently on sabbatical, for which we're very grateful because that's the only way we're able to get her for this semester. But since 2000, she has been the senior fellow at the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. In 2008-9, she was also a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. And she has been a visiting professor in the program of African Studies at Northwestern University, a research scholar in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago, a Fulbright New Century Scholar, conducting research in Nigeria, and that's just the last eight years. The list goes on and on and on. Dr. Pedran holds a DPhil from Oxford University, a diploma from Al-Hazar University, two masters, one from Harvard, the other from Syracuse, and her bachelor's degree is from Trinity College in Washington, DC. She has received many, many honors and grants from organizations such as the Ford Foundation, the Annenberg Research Institute, and the American Research Center, to name but a few. She is also a member of numerous professional associations, and she serves on, or has served on, 
many boards. The bulk of Dr. Bedran's CV contains her publications and presentations, and believe me when I say that they are very impressive indeed. She has authored or edited no fewer than eight books and countless articles. And in the past few years alone, she has presented in Oxford, Indonesia, Barcelona, Paris, and various locations throughout the States. I just can't imagine how she does it all. She stays standing, it's amazing. Dr. Bedran is an internationally recognized authority on the topic of Islamic feminism. And I know that it is she whom you have come to hear tonight, not me. So without any further ado, but with great respect and appreciation for the depth and breadth of her scholarship, I happily introduce to you Dr. Margot Bedran. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Uh, you daunt me, <laughs> overwhelm me with your um, words. Uh, it is wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to be with the Khatibs who have become friends since the moment we met uh, last fall. Was it last fall? Yes, it was. Um, and uh, it's a very um, uh, happy occasion for me to be here tonight, and uh, I shall plunge into my talk, and then I hope we will have a lively discussion and as I told some of my friends, uh, this is the expurgated version. So if you want uh, other things, you'll have to ask for them. Um, the title of uh, my presentation is Islam and Gender, Journey into the 21st Century. So let me say by, uh, start off by uh, thanking the Khatibs. I'm honored and delighted to be here with you tonight as the second holder of the Dr. Riza and Georgiana Clifford Khatib Chair in Comparative Religion here at St. Joseph's College. Uh, this wonderful bequest makes possible a special sharing and exchange of knowledge as uh, Sister Elizabeth was saying. And I've really, really enjoyed my uh, venture so far and I'm delighted that I have still several weeks ahead of me. Um, I would like uh, to thank Dr. Riza and Mrs. Uh, Georgiana Khatib for such a splendid opportunity to be among all of you here. I thank Sister Elizabeth, President of the College, Professor Thomas Petriano, did he disappear? I don't see him. Um, who is the head of the Department of Religious Studies and all the others at St. Joseph's for their warm welcome and support. Um, which really from day one was uh, very um, touching for me. Um, I was excited to take up this chair and my excitement continues as I engage with students at St. Joseph's in exploring the journey of gender and Islam into the 21st uh, century. And we already had some wonderful conversations about some of this at the table before. To right now. Um, I thought tonight, um, as we gather together, I might weave something of my own journey with the journey of Islam and gender into the 21st century. My own journey began in upstate New York, and as I was saying, it's not Nayak. It's much farther north in Syracuse, in what you might think of as the tundra of the far north. Um, when I set out into the world, I wonder if my mother uttered the Irish prayer, may the road rise gently before you, and may the wind be always at your back, and may the good Lord always hold you in the palm of his hand. It must have been so, for it has been a fantastical journey. I used the compass that pointed eastward, first to Europe, of course, for us, Europe is east, isn't it? Not quite oriental, but east. Then to the countries of the South and East Mediterranean, to the vast Indian subcontinent, and on to the sprawling lands of Southeast Asia, and a loop down the great continent of, of Africa to the southern tip, where I've been told the Khatibs will be going uh, before long. Was I unconsciously following in the footsteps of the legendary 14th century Muslim traveler Ibn Battuta, who traveled from his home in the far west, al Maghreb al-Aqsa, as the Arabs call his native Morocco, 
setting out eastward by land and sea, traversing much of the Islamic realm of his day. My colleague Miriam Cook, with whom I edited an anthology of Arab feminist writings, calls me Mrs. Batuta. But actually, I, prefer, I would prefer that she call me Ms. Batuta. <laughs> um, whether one is a 14th century traveler, a 20th century traveler, or a 21st century traveler, journeying through the vast stretches of Muslim lands reveals the richly varied ways of being Muslim, of how Muslims and others have for long centuries lived together, and how they have produced stunning civilizations from Andalusia in the west to the Ottoman domains to the Persian realms to the Ind Indonesian archipelago. If Muslims have created diverse cultures, they share a common creed transmitted through the Quran and illuminated by the Hadith, the sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. Muslims are called upon to embark upon the rightly guided path, the Sharia, which literally means path or way, and is discerned from engaging first and foremost with the Quran and with other religious texts as well. Life in the deeply religious sense is a path or a continual journey toward perfection. It is the unity in diversity and the diversity in unity that constitutes <coughs> the ummah or the global community of Muslims. As a world that travel both physical and figurative can open up to us. The journey of Islam and gender into the 21st century is a story of travel in real space and cyberspace. The speed and immediacy of our travels knit us together in ways unimaginable to our, or, our legendary 14th century traveler Ibn Battuta. Our virtual and real communities of the 21st century impinge on ways that require new conceptual tools, new politics, and a new imagination. We are citizens of nation states which permit us entry and exit, and in which, in, inside which we are bound by particular laws. Yet we also inhabit transnational cyberspace where we may roam with vastly greater freedom than might be possible within the borders of our own countries. If Islam is a new religion first spread out, uh, outward from Arabia in the seventh century, gradually fanning out over the centuries via caravan routes and sea lanes, gender as a concept, a new concept, shot with dizzying speed around the globe in the late 20th century via the internet. We can say that the World Wide Web circulated gender through the World Wide Ummah. Gender at once a concept and an analytical tool that helps us to distinguish the, distinguish the cultural construction of women and men from such sex as a biological category has helped us to unlock the profound wisdom that religions hold for us as insan or humankind to use the Quranic term. Women as scholars, intellectuals, and writers in the Muslim world we're quick to appropriate a gender as a tool to analyze what it means to be a woman or women and the dynamics of male-female relations within the world of Islam. The word gender passed rapidly into the lexicons of the major languages that Muslims speak. For more than two decades now, new understandings about women and gender and Islam have careened through the global ummah. I say careened because they have hurtled through perilous terrain encountering both great receptivity and stiff resistance. In far-flung parts of the ummah, women scholars use the new analytical tool of gender together with the classical methodologies of the Islamic sciences in scrutinizing the Quran and other uh, religious texts. Through the age-old practice of ijtihad, or critical investigation of religious texts, um, as critical investigation of religious texts is called, it's called ijtihad, it's um, uh, women um, asking their own questions arising from their own vantage point and lived experience articulated an egalitarian understanding of Islam, 
rejecting human inequality uh, perpetuated by patriarchy in the name of Islam. In other words, when women had the education, the background, the learning, um, and certainly the motivation, um, they began to ask and to, uh, their own questions and to try to figure out what their religion was instead of simply being mainly recipients of how other people um, uh, explained it to them. Uh, Pakistan, Pakistani-American scholar Esma Barlas has demonstrated how patriarchy insinuated itself into Islam in her 2002 book, Women, Believing Women in Islam, with the subtitle, Unreading Patriarchal Interpretations of the Quran. It's a very fine piece of work. Women scholars scrutinizing their scripture marveled at how the religion of Islam, which came to eradicate inequalities of race, ethnicity, and gender, was manipulated by the patriarchal cultures into which it was introduced and took root, subverting its basic message of human equality. The discourse of equality of all humankind, or in San, as fundamental to Islam, which includes the equality of women and men in family and society that women interpreters of the Quran articulated has been called Islamic feminism by other women who were sympathetic observers. So the people who were working the text and creating this new discourse were not the ones who gave it the name. And the women who give it, gave it the name Islamic feminism were themselves Muslims, but they were so-called secular feminists and they were very excited and appreciated um, this new reading because sometimes people will try to tell us, you know, secular feminists, Islamic feminists are at swords points and so on, which is simply uh, basically not true. Um, very simply defined, Islamic feminism derives its understanding and mandate from the Quran, seeking the practice of equality, rights, dignity, and justice for women and for men in the totality of their existence. So another problem is that people think that feminists are only interested in rights for women. But if we're talking about equality and dignity and all these things, they're interactive and intersecting, and they're part of what feminists and all of the rest, want, I mean, those like-minded people want for everyone. And you can't have, have Equal rights uh, and um, privileges. I mean, for only one set of people, over uh, without having them um, be enjoy, uh, enjoyed by others. One of the earliest sites of the production of Islamic feminist discourse was the Islamic Republic of Iran. Scholars and writers began to publish their egalitarian readings of Islam in the journal uh, called Zanan founded in 1992 by Shahla Sherkat from among the group known as the New Religious Intellectuals. And this was a moment when there was a certain opening up. And um, so these ideas began circulating in the early 1990s in this journal and other vehicles. These egalitarian readings not only circulated in Iran, but quickly reached others in the global Ummah via Anglophone Iranian women scholars in the diaspora. The first book-length treatise, and now a classic, was of Islamic feminism, that is, was produced by the African-American scholar Amina Wadud, who published her Quran and Woman, uh, reading the sacred text from a woman's perspective in 1991 in Malaysia and again republished it eight years later with Oxford University Press. Her book has also been uh, translated into many languages and uh, remains in press uh, to this day. So you see the dates, 1992, Zanan, 1991, Quran and Woman. And what was happening was similar thinking was popping up literally in different parts of the Ummah. I'm only giving you two examples and people who weren't necessarily in touch with each other were working the text, asking the questions, and coming uh, to similar conclusions. And of course, all of this <coughs> excuse me, uh, shot through the 
uh, you know, through the internet and so on. So it started feeding each other. But in the beginning, really, you just, it was happening so quickly. It was popping here and there, and I was watching it at the time, and it was pretty exciting. Maybe there's some water somewhere. Um, the principle of gender equality at the core of the Quran continues to be assailed by patriarchal maneuvers that simultaneously place women as subordinate to men and elevate um, them, that is women, uh, above uh, the level of uh, humankind in a dizzying contradiction. Pioneering Egyptian feminist leader Hoda Sharawi, reflecting in her memoirs on women's vital roles in the national independence movement early last century, wrote, through their arrogance, thank you, through their arrogance, um, where am I? Uh, men refused to see the capabilities of women. Faced with a contradiction, they preferred to raise women above the ordinary human plane instead of placing them on a level equal to their own. Men have singled out women of extraordinary or ex uh, outstanding merit and put them on a pedestal to avoid recognizing the abilities of all women. And she goes on to say, and women felt this in their souls. So they were either, women were either made to feel subordinate or they were made, they were put on the pedestal. And so this was a problem. I mean, where was the equality? Uh, as a young uh, graduate student freshly arrived in Egypt, I will say four decades ago to brag about my longevity, <laughs> Um, I was introduced to the legacy of Hoda Sharawi by a handful of elderly women who had been with Sharawi in the cauldron of the emergent feminist movement early last century. This was the beginning for me of um, becoming part of uh, what I call the vertical and horizontal, horizontal links in the silsila or chain that unites us um, through which both memory and the events of the moment circulate, and which together form a complex ta uh, tapestry. So this journey is a journey through space, and it's a journey through time that we take. And I, as a historian, was um, uh, started my life, as I said, early last century, um, no, sorry, not early last century, um, uh, investigating the feminist movement of early last century, and I met these women who were part of it, so I could have the last whiff of early feminism. And as I've moved along, um, I have carried with me the tales of the past, the tales of the present, and, and uh, so one has these lines going this way, and these um, encounters, thank you so much. I have so much water now that I will drown. Um, the penchant, um, now I'm getting back to the pedestal, the penchant for putting women on a pedestal and leaving them there that Egyptian feminists decried half a, se a century ago remains alive and well as my students and I saw last week when we visited a mosque here in Brooklyn where we were graciously received by the imam who happens to be from Egypt, which made it interesting for me. Uh, when we asked him about gender, inequa gender equality in Islam, he answered with the often cited uh, hadith, paradise lies at the feet of women, to demonstrate that women are revered, i.e. the pedestal effect. Um, and, and he cleverly sidestepped, uh, sidestepped having to deal with the question of equality. We asked if women are so respected why are they, he told, by this time we had seen the layout, a layout of the mosque and so on and the, uh, the way things were organized at this uh, place. So we asked him why, if women are so respected, are they relegated to the, to the basement of the mosque during prayer? The congregation's shared use of central space has been an issue in South Africa, as we will see in a moment, and one that is now being hotly contested in parts of this country. And there's a movement underway 
um, in some places, including in Washington, mind you, by a handful of women who are fed up with having to be put in a balcony or put in a basement or put wherever, and they are making demands to be able to pray with men in the central hall. And as we were discussing at dinner, the arguments that are given are basically social arguments or sexual arguments. The men are going to get also distracted and you know excited and this sort of thing. But we haven't heard any persuasive um, uh, religious arguments. And it just happened this morning, because I'm part of these folks, of course. I mean, it is rather exciting. It's too irresistible to not be part of, you know, sort of desegregating anything. Um, and. Um, so as I was trying to get myself together to get on the train to get, you know, over here to Brooklyn, I got an email, um, and it wasn't. It was from Darl Ifta in, in Cairo. That is the house where they give um, fatwas, and of course, fatwa is a relig religious opinion. Now I hadn't asked the question, but one of my colleagues who's in this mosque desegregation movement, sent a, a question over to Cairo, to the Dar al Ifta, and said, is it okay for women uh, to pray um, in the same hall with men? And the answer came back in English, uh, they have an English section there, um, that it is permissible. Now, uh, the thing is, I said to her, okay, because uh, I, s yeah, I mean, um, she has her name as, it, it, she, she wouldn't mind if I say her name. Her name is Fatima Thompson. And I said, Fatima, with a name like Thompson, you're ready, you'll probably get it's permissible. Because first, you cannot pray together in a mosque in Egypt. And Dar al Ifta is in Cairo. So I think, you know, there are different flavors of fetwas for different places. So I said, I think what you better do is to, uh, you know, get a new Yahoo account and give yourself a Muslim last name and ask the same question. So she wrote back, and she had a better idea yet, and she, we have a colleague uh, who is named Ka uh, Karim um, al Bayadar, and she said, why don't we get Karim to answer, ask the question? And then I wrote back and I said, yes, that's even better yet because he's a man. And so the man and the Arabic and the whole thing. But uh, it is true, actually, that there are different kinds of opinions given to people in different parts of the world. And they try to soften the message for us over here. But we're not, you know, sort of hoodwinked by it because we know what's going on in Egypt, even though they don't know, we know. And also, she didn't like it because we want ammunition. And they didn't cite any hadiths, any readings or anything. So she wrote back. I said, I think you should write back and ask for this. And she, again, she was quicker than I. And she said, I've already written back and say, please give the sources for this. So um, to give you an idea of what's going on. OK. Now, uh, getting back to Brooklyn. Where am I? Oh yes, um, so I just wanted to um, say uh, my little uh, small world story, you know, with, since I'm talking about these multiple journeys of my own. Um, so this little small world uh, uh, um, story is again in Brooklyn, in Bay Ridge. When I first got there, um, I introduced us and myself, and Imam didn't really say much about himself, but that was all right. And uh, I told them that I'd gone to Azhar, Al Azhar, which many of you know is the Islamic University, very ancient, distinguished Islamic University in Cairo, which has a worldwide sort of reputation, and people come from all over. And so, so he just looked at me and he said, "Well, what section were you in?" And I just said I was in a section for foreigners. I just, just to simplify it, and that was the end of that. So he probably thought I just had a few little. Uh, hafif lessons, you know, light little lessons, and that wasn't a worry. So, um, at the end of um, the stay, um, after he had given us his little answers and he wouldn't talk about equality, and some of the students really pushed because I had them very primed, and probably they didn't need too much priming because they understand equality. It's not the difficult concept. And some of them were Muslims. 
So they, you know, I mean, they kind of came from within uh, the tradition, but you don't have to. I mean, equality, you can ask anybody of any religion to explain their inequality to you, it seems to me. If they like it, they ought to know why they like it. So in any case, um, it, he, gave, he gave answers that were rather superficial. His English wasn't that great. I was trying to translate. My Arabic has gotten rusty. So I, I mean, there were some sort of technical problems. But at the very end, I said to him, do you know, and I mentioned the name of my sheikh, my main sheikh. And his eyes then really, he really did look, you know, kind of, he, he opened his eyes and I said, you know, that he was my teacher and he was very, then he got impressed. And he said, you know, he is the teacher of teachers and he is this great alam and all this sort of thing. And so I, we talked a little bit about him. And uh, I felt that sort of my stock had gone up at that point, but um, there was, we were literally on the way out the door. And so I get back here to 245 Clinton, and I'm getting my stuff ready to go to Manhattan, you know, to the journey south again. And my cell phone rings, and it's Imam Muhammad. <laughs> and I'm wondering, you know, what's Imam Muhammad calling me for? Anyway, what he said was he wanted me to present all the questions in writing so he could give more complete answers. And I wasn't sure, I mean, what I really thought was that he realized that he had not done well, I mean, that he had not really uh, taken the challenge properly. He, had not, he would given us rather superficial answers. Because I did tell him also that I would tell my, our sheikh that I had seen him and that I see the sheikh and all this sort of thing, which I do. And um, so he wants me to send over these um, questions, which I will do. Because either he will, uh, I mean, whatever he says will be interesting because uh, we hope that he will expand, because he said he'll give f uh, more full answers, so he'll either explain why we can't have equality, or why we could, or whatever it is. And then he also said, and I felt he was very sincere, he said, tell the students at St. Joseph's, anytime they want to email me, or anytime they want anything, I'm here. And I felt that was also a very, I mean, that was a good thing. And I did feel that he was actually pleased with the visit. And I did feel that he felt that he hadn't really stepped up to the plate, uh, which is okay, I mean, if, if he starts to. Okay, now I would like to uh, go farther afield in this journey, and I promise um, that I won't take you everywhere I've been because we'll never get out of here tonight, so I'm taking us to two countries, and then we can have some interesting conversation. In 1999, I found myself in South Africa, I had been invited by Witzwatersrand, I can never say that, University in Johannesburg to give uh, lectures on uh, Egyptian feminism in a teen taught course on feminisms in Africa. And this was really exciting for me because I had never been um, to South Africa. In fact, my travels in Africa uh, up to that point had been limited to the Northern Rim and a bit of the East. And, uh, so anyway, I took part in this, uh, in this course, and I, uh, when I arrived in South Africa, was in 1999, this was the time when Islamic feminism was really on the rise. I told you that these early publications, 1991, 92, and uh, so I really wanted to see what the scene was, and I, uh, but I didn't know how to find Muslims because the course on Egyptian feminisms, this was what you call secular feminisms. I mean, they were the, because Egyptians are Christian, they're Muslim. And so these were feminisms produced by these folks together in which, by the way, secular feminism really is another word for, um, you might say national feminism. So secular in a sense is Egyptian. It's not like Christian or Muslim. So it's a, it's a national uh, sort of construct. And, um, uh, so uh, I, uh, uh, this, uh, I was teaching this course and um, on, on secular feminisms, as were the other course, uh, the other courses. Uh, I mean, the other segments in African feminisms, and I really wanted to find, uh, make contact with Muslims to see what's going on in the Muslim scene. And uh, so I uh, did not know how to make contacts with Muslims. 
And I did what I often do at moments like this. I did nothing. But it worked. Before long, the Muslims I was seeking found me. And you know very often, many of you who've traveled in certain parts, I mean, things just happen. And it turned out there were a couple of Muslims in the class, and they told other people, and so on, and then they came. And so I didn't have to do any work to have this happen. And I was given um, a message that an imam, uh, these imams and I seem to have relationships at some level, of a mosque in the Brighton section of Johannesburg was inviting me to give the pre-sermon talk at the Friday prayer the following week. And he specified the subject. Do you know what he specified? Islamic feminism. Now, I come from Egypt. First of all, as my husband said, who's Egyptian, I mean, there's no way anybody would invite me or any other female to come into a mosque and give a talk. We wouldn't come in the front door, we wouldn't be part of the scene, but we wouldn't be invited there anyway, and nobody would even think of having a talk on Islamic feminism, and it's all just wouldn't happen. Now, this is an interesting thing, they call it a pre-sermon talk. Now, in Arabic, the khutbah is really it, we call it sermon when we translate, because I guess when you give a talk in a church or a mosque, it's a sermon, but a khutbah is really a talk. So in, in, Arab, in, in South Africa, where they're speaking English, they, khutbah is you know, very grand and very sacred, and talk is talk. So for us in, in, in Egypt, you couldn't say, come and give a khutbah or a pre-khutbah khutbah. It would all be the same khutbah. So it was a little conceit that I thought was rather quaint and interesting, and it worked. Um, okay, so, um, so of course, for a feminist, this was just too hard to resist. You know, I get the message and uh, I come to the mosque at this time in this place, and a friend dro drove me over. And she left, and she was going to pick me up. So uh, the next week, as I said, I found myself on the way to the mosque with this friend, and I was preparing to enter through the front door. I mean, it seemed pretty natural to me because I don't go to mosques and I, therefore I don't think of anything but front doors in my life. When suddenly a man appeared and brusquely said, sister, go around to the back. And, you know, I, I mean, I was pretty upset or I was not amused as I wrote here. But also, it suddenly occurred to me what religion do they think I am? I mean, I suddenly thought, oh my God. You know, because I don't think of myself as a religion, and we all have religions in a set, you know, but, but I don't, you know, run around thinking what I am. And somebody asks me to come give a talk, and it's in a mosque, it's fine, but this was the pre chutba and then when he said sister, that's what drove me, you know, kind of shook me. So I, I uh, was not happy, but I said, well, I better, I mean, there's no turning back now. So I made my way to the back, through a little door, and up some stairs, and into a glassed-off balcony, which, in this church converted into a mosque, uh, used to be the choir loft, minus the glass. So, I mean, you can imagine the scene. I mean, it looks like a church, but it isn't a church and we're relegated, and then you've got this kind of space, you know, this glass. So I, I don't know if I felt like Alice in Wonderland or what I felt like, but there I was. It was, um, the space to me was sad, claustrophobic space, but when it began to fill with women, they were so kind and welcoming and friendly, I started to rather like the place. And soon I was ushered to the microphone. After the opening prayers and words in a combination of Arabic and English, the imam's disembodied voice, his all down, invited me to give my talk. Also in a combination of Arabic and English, and also disembodied before the male part of the congregation, I proceeded to speak about Islamic feminism. And of course, I, I, mean, I thought it was a little bizarre to do it in a mosque, and I didn't know, you know, these folks are down there. And um, I, um, uh, where am I now? Here. Uh, okay, so I proceeded to speak about Islamic feminism. 
And of course, I was with the women, and I could see they were very happy, because I could actually see them. Uh, but what about the men who were invisible to me? So I had no idea how they were dealing with this. But the imam, from his voice and words, appeared satisfied, and so I took some comfort, I suppose, and satisfaction in that. Um, I was headed uh, the fo <coughs> following week to uh, Cape Town, where I was invited to give um, um, a talk on Islamic feminism in the Claremont Main Road Mosque, because I was now being passed around from one to the other. You see, I was out of control, of course, of this. <laughs> I'm not quite liking it at the same time. And by that time, I didn't ask myself what my religion was because I figured they weren't asking me. It's kind of don't, you know, don't say, don't tell, so that's the end of it. Um, or don't ask, don't tell. So this time I was taken in through the front door, and I'm telling this story because we're in the same country. And so many people think Islam and Muslim, and it's all the same. So here we are in South Africa. This is another South African story. They take me in through the front door, you can imagine how exciting that was, into the main hall, the main hall. And they ushered me to the pulpit, the minbar next to the Qibla. And the Qibla, as you must know, is that prayer arch. And this was no church before, so it looked more musky than the old church looked. Um, so they took me next to this Qibla, where I faced a house full of men and women ranged on two sides of the hall. So they were together, although one, the men were on one side and the women were on the other, but they were in the same hall, and I was looking at them. I have to confess that when I saw the folks pouring in, it was daunting. Throwing political correctness to the winds, I suddenly yearned for segregation. <laughs> I swear, I mean, it was scary because they all filed in and many of them on Friday, you know, people sometimes wear their own garb from whatever place they come from and they're, you know, and so on. And, and they looked very Muslim to me. I mean, of course they were Muslims, but you know, it, it was, it, I, I, I didn't look like them even though I had, you know, stuff on my head and everything, but um, it was scary. Anyway, um, now I'm going to, I, I, you know, when you write, you have to sort of, I want to fill you in. So um, I want to take you back five years before this event. Amina Wadud, and she's the one, you know, whose book, Quran and Woman, had been very well received in Africa, uh, South Africa, was visiting the country en route back to the US from Malaysia, where she had been teaching. And I'm giving you this kind of itinerary, these itineraries, because you see, we're all knitted and pearled together in quite wonderful ways. And so, you know, we get invited, we invite, we meet, we hear, we do. And uh, Amin and I are very dear friends, and we've known each other for many years. And, um, so th this, there is this kind of um, web netted network that we have. Anyway, so she's on her way, I didn't know her then, she's on her way back to the US. And this is uh, five years before, that is uh, 1994. And this was af just after the fall of apartheid. Uh, and um, w uh, Muslims had played very uh, important roles in, in the struggle or in helping to end apartheid as did all, virtually all segments of the population, or at least the, the color, the black, the liberal whites, and the whole thing. Um, upon uh, the invitation of several men at the Claremont Main Road Mosque, where I had done my thing, Wadud was invited to give a pre-sermon talk at the Friday prayer, prayer. Now this was the very first time, uh, sorry, on this occasion, and this also, her talk was the first time a woman had given a pre-chutbah talk. And I think it was the time when they figured out they would call it the pre-chutbah talk. I mean, to kind of, you know, make sure that nobody thought it was a chutbah because they couldn't really deal with that, although it was a chutbah. Anyhow, um, so uh, on this occasion when Amina is there lecturing, uh, I mean, giving her uh, talk, 
um, the women, for the very first time, came down from the balcony, because at that mosque they were all in the balcony like in the other mosque, but that was five years earlier. They descended from the balcony where they had, of course, been required to sit and entered the main hall of the mosque. Threats were made against Wadud's life, the wife of the imam and others, and there were subsequent acts of violence and her, the rest of her trip, her appearances um, had to be canceled. It was very dangerous. There were firebombs and it was a very, very uh, pretty uh, nasty uh, scene. Uh, but by the time I arrived five years later, and it's only five years later, things had settled down. Women never left the main space of the mosque. And by this time, uh, men and women, Muslims and non-Muslims, were routinely invited, invited to give pre-sermon talks. And so you see, it, it, they really changed the practice um, there. Now, it was, and, and I'm thinking, you know, this is the first time that I had ever seen a kind of mosque activism in terms of having a woman give, a, you can call it the chutbah, the pre-chutbah, um, and women and men mixing in the central space. And when I thought about it, um, that, well, so they, that is South African Muslims, were the ones who were leading the pack in desegregating mosque space. We're talking 1994. Here we are in 2002, and the main mosque in Massachusetts Avenue, this glitzy place, cannot tolerate women in the main hall, and this is the United States. So we don't have to always think in some other countries, you know, they're backward and we're so cool and up, for, you know, uh, head here. Uh, but I thought, you know, it's, it's no wonder that this happened in South Africa, because these folks had been apartheid, had split them all up. And so you had the coloreds and the blacks and everything. There was this racial segregation, racial apartheid. And when the um, movement was over, that is when, I mean, the, you know, after the end of apartheid, uh, Muslims who were part of that anti-apartheid movement um, were carrying on the struggle inside their own communities. And they were not pleased with this idea of gender apartheid. And this idea of space is very, very imprinted in uh, people's minds, of course, in South Africa. And also, I mean, space, for example, you know, when people set up a segregation, the people who set it up and impose it take the best space for themselves. And so you can see the parallels within the community, you know, the best space going to the men and so on. So I think that was part of their wanting to realign and redesign the community. And it happened in South Africa, the uh, Muslim and the men were very, and women, but men uh, particularly, very noticeably, were very much in the foreground with women in trying to, um, you know, affect this change. Now, I'm in contact a little bit with some of the um, desegregation movements here, and mostly so far it's women. It's not all women, no, but it's more women. Uh, so, Indonesia is um, another country I'd like to uh, mention in my travel story. In 2002, when I was a fellow at the Institute for the Study of Islam in the Modern World in Leiden in the Netherlands, a colleague informed me that a feminist from Indonesia wanted to meet me and would be presently knocking on my door. Um, so uh, I'm sitting there, you know, of course, doing what we do on our computer, doing my research and thinking. And soon a man of about 40 appeared. Um, uh, he knocked on my door. Uh, there, there, so he, this guy knocked on the door. He was a man of about 40, introduced himself as a religious teacher, or a kiai, as they're called, and a feminist. So I, I was quite surprised. I thought at first I thought it was going to be a woman anyway. But I have to confess that he did not uh, fit my notion of a feminist by a long shot. I really didn't know what to say, so I replied with a question mark, are you, are you a feminist? And he said, yes. 
And I said, you don't have a problem with feminism and Islam? And I can still really see him right in front of my eyes as I see you to this day. He looked at me with the most amazed and prolonged smile. You know, he had this smile and he just, you know, I, well, I didn't know it was inscrutable, inscrutable, what it was, but he just, he just looked like that at me. And he said nothing. So I was trying to provoke an, exclam an, an explanation of how he became a feminist and thought he understood the touch of irony in my voice when I said, you know, that you mean you have no problem being a feminist. But instead, you know, he just took me for an idiot, you know, and that's how I felt. He, you know, what is my problem that he is a feminist? Um, I soon learned that Mohammed Hussein, as he is called, and who is the son and grandson of Kiais, was at the fore forefront of a movement to reform religious education in the Pesantrans, uh, which are um, uh, Muslim boarding schools. You, you could call them a kind of madrasa, really, um, uh, for girls and boys uh, found throughout uh, Indonesia. And what he was doing, um, and these uh, uh, Pesantrans are usually, uh, they're private, they're uh, created by families and their path, uh, families of religious teachers and then the, um, the uh, teaching and uh, passes from father to son to grandson and so on. And um, they use, uh, he, what he was doing was he was taking the old books that they used, the classical texts used in the Pesantrans, and he was putting glosses, you know, sort of um, little interpretive notes um, uh, you know, they'd have the, into, the, into the text, inserting um, ideas of gender equality. I mean, how you could actually interpret it this way or how that interpretation was uh, complicated. But it was interesting because, I mean, it was problematic because he didn't, they didn't get rid of the old materials, but they tried to kind of tweak them or re, you know, recast them or, or get people to ask new questions about this. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, Indonesia has the largest number of Muslims in the entire uh, world. Uh, and uh, the Pesantrans are networked all across uh, the country. And so this is quite uh, an important uh, movement. And, and Kiai Hussein does call himself a feminist. I mean, he actually uses the term, and I mention that because in a lot of places, people will have more um, liberal ideas or progressive ideas about gender and they are afraid to use the word feminist. Later I met Kiai Hussein in Jakarta where he told me uh, he had been part of a committee in the Ministry of Justice headed by a woman called Mustamulia who is quite well known and she's a distinguished woman scholar of religious studies and this committee of religious scholars inside the Ministry of uh, uh, Justice was um, mandated to draft a new family law, a family law based on Islamic uh, jurisprudence, you know, but rethought and so on. And they produced the most amazing, uh, most progressive uh, family law that has ever been seen. It's even more progressive than the Moroccan law, which has gone, which to this day, I mean, now is the most advanced uh, family law that is um, cast within the framework of um, uh, Islamic jurisprudence or based on juris Islamic jurisprudence. Um, the law in, in Turkey, the civil code, is, is not grounded in, in Islamic jurisprudence, although when I interviewed um, some uh, religious teachers there, they told me, in their opinion, that this law expressed the spirit of Islam, but it's not um, uh, grounded explicitly in jurisprud Islamic jurisprudence. So the, uh, the draft law in Indonesia was shelved. And there, are, there were all sorts of, I mean, of course, Islamic arguments, very rigid arguments. The problem is now that we don't lack religious arguments. The problem is the political 
um, dimension. The problem is political at many levels, which we could uh, discuss. But in any case, um, that was, this is giving you a taste of what went on in, um, you know, what's going on in, um, in Indonesia. And, and I went back uh, again and I did a series of lectures and it was pretty interesting because there they have state Islamic universities and they have state secular universities. And it was so much easier for me to give lectures on Islamic feminism and have discussions on gender equality and all that sort of thing at the uh, state religious universities. Why? Because these people had studied Islam. Many of them went to Azhar, so we'd have our kind of old girl, old boy, Azhar sort of moment. But, but the thing was, they, they were learned. They, they knew what they were talking about. And they could, you know, come, you know, read the text in rich and different ways. Go to the state secular universities and it, where you have political Islamic movements, the Islamists, and very often they're engineers and med doctors, uh, med students, and you know more the scientific end of things. They haven't studied religion. They're very dogmatic. They have no arguments. They don't. I mean, argue, They just say this is how it is, but they don't know the religion. So it was just this was so wonderful for me because in most places, I mean, this you don't have state Islamic universities. Okay, we have one center in Egypt, but here they're spread out. So it was very, very interesting that you could have these, these um, conversations that were serious, that were grounded. People could have slightly different views, but uh, they knew what they were talking about. And uh, the other thing that was interesting uh, was every time we had a session at the state university, they would start with a Quran recitation. Um, which doesn't necessarily happen, usually in the Middle East, I mean, in my experience, they, even in more religious circles, it doesn't happen like that. Every place has its different, you know, sort of systems, um, procedures. And, of course, because it was me and the subject was, mm -hmm, they had women, but, I mean, the most beautiful voices, the recitation was absolutely exquisite. And, in many places, you will not get women reciting, God forbid, in front of men, because you know there has been this idea, even a woman's voice is aura, that is forbidden in, in, I mean, historically, that she shouldn't, her voice should not be heard. So in, it was very, very interesting what's going on in Indonesia, or what I learned about a very living, vibrant um, Islam that was full of, you know, sort of, um, uh, new and questions new ways, and uh, it was a very it was delightful to have intellectual exchanges with these folks. Um, so after I finish here at St. Joseph's, of course my journey will go on. Instead of just coming, I mean coming from Washington to Brooklyn, then I will be cast out on the seas again, and I will um, be um, Mustamulia, and I will be meeting with a bunch of folks in Frankfurt in May, um, as soon as my last class is here. And I use this as an example, as I said, because we keep engaging and meeting. We're Muslims, we're non-Muslims, we're from different countries, but we're, we're working with the same thing, uh, the same ideas. And so uh, all I wanted to say is that there's a brisk transnational circuit of thinking and debate on Islam and gender. And this is c increasing, and uh, these networks are expanding, and it's, it's not going to go away at all soon. Uh, the journey of Islam and gender in the 21st century, I talked about, sort of connected it with my journeys eastward. Um, and, uh, but it's also a journey um, of Islam and gender into the West, as my brief mention um, of my experience in Brooklyn indicates. And indeed, as probably most of you here know, Islam and Muslims are now an integral part of the, uh, uh, the West. Um, the, the journey of Islam and gender in the 21st century, everywhere in the world, whether East or West, is very much of a zigzag journey. And progressive Muslims everywhere uh, east, west, wherever, experience steps forward and backward, while conservatives experience steps forward and backward, except each one thinks forward is backward and backward is forward, or you know what I mean. So you have to be 
you know, understand that. Um, throughout the Ummah, an egalitarian understanding of Islam is competing with a patriarchal version. The patriarchal ver uh, 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 version is very tenacious, but the Islamic, uh, the egalitarian version is very compelling. Nothing in the short run uh, is very certain except that gender will remain a contested ground. We have all heard the word jihad, but many may not be familiar with its basic meaning, which is simply struggle. The title of Amina Wadud's latest book, Inside the Gender Jihad, succinctly captures the present and what lies ahead. I think the battle over defining Islam and women is so fierce now because the egalitarian reading of Islam is so compelling. The journey of Islam and gender continues, as do our own journeys. And with that, I will stop, and I hope we can have um, a little discussion. Thank you. Figuratively speaking, <laughs> in some places they actually shoot. Okay, Umma, uh, yes, I might have uh, galloped too quickly. The Umma is the Muslim community. That is the community, sometimes they say the nation, the community, or nation of Muslims. So it is, that's what it is. Yes, I mean, it's like Christendom. You know, it, it's it, 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 Muslims. I mean, you belong to the Ummah. You belong to the community. You could be Shiite or uh, Sunni or whatever. So you're part of the Ummah. But um, I'm also working with this concept of Ummah, which um, I think is pretty cool, um, because if you look into the Quran, there's something. Uh, because people, sometimes some people get very boring and they want to know who's a Muslim and who isn't. And today we are also mixed up in our, where we're born, where we grew up, um, because if you are a Christian in Egypt, you're very enculturated in a Muslim culture, and, and they will admit that. And, uh, uh, and, and so many people are married, you know, I mean, Georgian and I are both married to Muslims. It's, you know, we're, our families are blended, is one of the words used now. And, uh, and so I think, you know, this business of, you know, are you a Muslim or not, gets sort of tedious. Because it's, it gets tedious for me because it's a way of, of gaining legitimacy. So if they, most people don't know what I am and I, I don't feel I have to tell them. And uh, because I don't want to be legitim, I don't want to be legitimized or delegitimized um, by what I am. I want to be legitimized by what I say and do and the power of my, um, my um, argument. And um, there was something I was going with there, and I think I got off track. What could it have been? Oh, yes, the Oma thing. Um, so uh, I was doing a paper, and I was quite intrigued by the Oma idea. And um, some of you who know the Quran probably better than I do, but there's something called Oma Tel Insan. And there are different ways of using Oma in the Quran. And one of them means the Oma, which means the collectivity, the nation, the community of human beings. And so I quite like this idea that the Oma of human beings, Oma tal insan. And, uh, but also, of course, we need to use the term Oma as um, a collectivity of Muslims, naturally. But I, what I like about it is that there are many ways that you can be part of something and still have your own specificity. And I mean, that's what I, I think is important. I mean, we hold on to what we are, where we came from, who we are. But, it, but who we are doesn't have to mean we're not something else or we can't be part of something else. And I think we're getting into this much more now. We don't even have the vocabulary. We don't even have the, almost the, 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 I mean, the ways of expressing it because we're not used to that. We're very used to saying, you are you and I am me. And if think about it, we have all this vocabulary that, that define, uh, define, uh, divides us and specifies us. But the <laughs> vocabulary that helps us to be together 
is, is pretty lacking. And um, so, uh, I mean, that's what we're all facing. And the other thing, though, I must say that among there's, uh, younger people, um, you'll have two kinds. Of course, you get the rigid types, but then you have these immensely interesting, open, open student, uh, young people who, who just are coming up in a, in a world that is very intersecting. Yes? What's your take on women complaining to wear traditional garments to niqab or the veil in France and Turkey? Is it that, are they just perpetuating concern of cultural trends, or is it their own brand of Islamic feminism? Um, okay, I, um, I usually avoid veils, but I will since you've asked the question. Um, let it's it's I think it it's very complicated. Um, uh, I let me just answer sort of broadly. I'm not um, in favor of legislating uh, veiling or unveiling because we have countries where you have to veil and we have countries where you may not veil. Or we have situations, if you want a government job, you can't have it if you're veiled and so on. I don't like this whole legislating um, approach uh, to veiling. Now, um, people say uh, that uh, they chose to wear the veil freely, that their husbands, their fathers, their God knows whose, their mothers did not ask them to veil. Probably that's true. And again, as a historian, I always stay very specific. But I can't, I mean, I'm, using, I'm speaking more generally now, and I know the scene in Egypt very clearly from early 20th century through my studies, and I've seen the different moments. But um, the thing is that I don't think uh, taking on hijab um, is fully uh, a totally independent uh, decision because things are contextualized. If it was so independent, uh, let's just take Egypt now. Why in the 50s and 60s didn't people put on the veil? I mean, they were free then. They didn't do it because the context was different. And I know very well from my studies that when, and, and I'm not talking about countries where it's mandated, I'm not talking, say, Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, now I've lost my thought again. Um, the, 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 yes, the con, in other words, there is a context in which actions occur. And so when people started veiling in Egypt in the 70s, for example, that's when it started, it's a little bit in the 60s, in the 70s and 80s. And now each time I go back, even if I go back in six months, I'll see more veils than I did before. Um, but this happened with the rise of political Islam, Islamic movements, Islamism. And in the beginning, and I was there, and I know it very well in Egypt, the folks who put on hijabs were at the universities. They were students. And it was, that's where political Islam started taking root in a sociological sense. Um, and so about, certainly within 10 years, a little bit less perhaps, it's hard to be very precise. You have a broader cultural re revival. But the cultural revival comes in the wake of the political revival. And so there is, becomes this notion that in order to be a proper Muslim, you must wear a job. That was not the case in the 50s and 60s. And when Hoda Sharawi, who, and those folks I studied, they took off the, well, this was the face veil, and then eventually this part went too. Um, and they had religious arguments for taking it off. And then once it was off, it was off. And people did not go around thinking they were bad Muslims because they didn't have a veil. So um, these things are contextual. People are influenced by other people. There are a lot of people in this country who are converts, for example, who put on hijab. And I ask, you know, the ones that I, I'm 
friendly with or whatever. I mean, I don't ask every woman I see, you know, on Fifth Avenue why you're wearing a hijab. But, um, and many say that they don't wear it for religious reasons. They wear it to identify as Muslims. And this con connects to, in part to 9-11 because people wanted to, you know, if we're going to be denigrated, I mean, that's their idea, you know, that we're going to stand up and we're going to assert our Muslim identity. But it, what they said they don't wear it for Islamic reasons. So it's a very complicated thing. On the other hand, there are people, I mean, I think people who think they take it up totally freely, take it up very sincerely. I think more people take it up sincerely than, than the examples I gave. It's just that they think that it's totally independent. And I think all of what we do is anchored, including my own life, including my own ideas. My ideas now are not the ideas I grew up in upstate New York with, because life has changed. And so you're in context. So the veil is part of context. And, um, and it is being represented, this hijab, I'm not talking this, as an Islamic requirement. And, it, and I belong to the school that it just simply does not buy that. There are many sheikhs and religious people who say, no, it's not necessary. And, um, and people are not being given either that, I mean, they're not given the choice in the sense that if you're made to think you're not quite religiously proper, and you want to be, you're more likely to flip in, in that direction. But that's a bit of a long answer. Anyway, yes? I, I was curious about your talks that you gave in the South African mosque on Islam and feminism, and I was wondering if you gave those talks today, how different would they be today compared to those talks? And could you just give a couple of points you made back then? Well, um, hmm. it's hard for me to remember what I said. Um, I, uh, would I, they be different? Probably more fierce than today than they were then. No, I, I, what I did was um, actually, I, I used a lot of the ideas of people like the men, I mentioned uh, the Iranian women who I only know about in translation or in women talking about them and their ideas. Um, um, Amina Wadud's book, uh, Asma Barlas's book. I mean, I read all that literature. I mean, all the you know sort of texts that are now considered to be texts of Islamic feminism. And uh, I basically uh, just uh, make the religious or theological arguments that you know um, uh, equality can be understood by reading certain texts. And there's the uh, the the um, chapter of uh, Surat al-Nisa, the chapter of women and so on in the Quran, and the verses that are used to argue that women have authority over women, uh, man, uh, sorry, women, men have authority over women, for example. I mean, it's very easy to deconstruct that and to put it back into a context and um, to argue that this isn't the case. So I use those techniques, mainly sort of exegetical, uh, 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 exegetal. Um, but now, Islamic feminists himself, it's, it's now more than 20 years old, it's getting very interesting. And even Amina Wadud, I mean, she, in her new book, Gender, Inside the Gender Jihad, I mean, she's really saying, I don't have to go through some of the acrobatics, she, I think she even used that term. I mean, she does a lot of linguistic work, so do I, and it's pretty fascinating, and it's helpful. But, but what she's saying is that you can use um, language um, to deconstruct, and these folks learned a lot from uh, the Christians and Jews, liberation theology, I mean the ones over here. Um, but she's saying uh, we don't have to also do that, and that we can um, move out of the box, as she said. For example, I mean many of you know this question of slavery. I mean, slavery is, as it were, permitted because slavery was part of life in the moment when the Quran came. So what the Quran was doing was trying to, you know, kind of give ideas of how you can better treat folks and st because that was happening all the time through wars of conquest and, you know, enslavements and so on. Um, and in the, um, by the 19th century, you know, slavery is not considered to be uh, <laughs> very appropriate and uh, slavery is 
not practiced in the way it used to be through conquest, although there was slavery of the type we had here and so on, and anti-slavery movements. And um, uh, slave, uh, the selling of slaves was outlawed, for example, in Egypt in 1877. And, um, and nobody will make an argument, or there might be one or two people, I don't know. No, but uh, they will not um, uh, come out in favor of slavery, even though it's permitted in the Quran. Because this is, you know, finished, it's a new era, we have new ways of thinking, we have new, and it's just not acceptable. And, and so we, we don't have to do linguistic analysis, um, you know, taking it in and out of, con well, to some extent context, meaning it's just not um, part of our life today, I mean, uh, in the way that it used to be, the way the Quran talked about it. But, but uh, Amina and others, and I myself, I mean, just say, we can get rid of polygamy. Because uh, it, just because it's permitted doesn't mean it ha I mean, of course, it doesn't mean it has to be done, but it doesn't mean that you can, that you have to continue to like it or to find it acceptable within the Islamic framework. That is not going to happen for a very long time. In, in uh, North Africa, which has the most advanced law grounded in, in fiqh, in Islamic jurisprudence, um, male and female are head, equal head of family. That's pretty you know, advanced, actually. Um, I mean, that's the only law which actually explicitly says it. Forget Egypt, it doesn't. Um, but uh, they made, put so many conditions on polygamy that it's impossible. But they didn't outlaw it such. And again, these are political moves because you can only go so far politically, but they could religiously, like that, get rid of it. But, uh, so today, to answer your question, I would use, talk more about the um, uh, arguing out of the box type of thing. I mean, in other words, things aren't acceptable, and you're not gonna make me sit for 20, you know, for five hours and explain through complex linguistic analysis why um, something isn't acceptable. It just isn't acceptable. It offends our sensibility, our dignity, our whatever, and, and we're not going to um, uh, you know, uh, you know, try to uh, give you complicated reasons. It's the basic reason. It's not acceptable because of those reasons. End of story. And they can take it or, or, or not take it if they wish. And so I would talk more of, about these moves. I will tell you, yes. I wouldn't mind asking another question about uh, the feminine in Islamic prayer in God language. Would you, would you be able to say anything about that? Uh, the feminine? And in God language in Islamic prayer. Any feminine images of God in Excuse me, say that, that last piece. Any, Any feminine God images in Islam regarding, uh, you know, some of the issues we deal with regarding inclusive language versus... Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, there's a lot, uh, there's, I mean, God, okay, there's a lot of stuff in the Quran that we don't, um, I mean, I'm thinking of not God, but other things um, like human. Uh, uh, some, many of the translations of, in the Quran say um, mankind, for example, and man, when insan is not, insan is human, and you can't do that. As far as God is concerned, I mean, our dude is great on that subject because, I mean, there is no gendering of God. It's not that there's female or male or feminine or masculine, it's just ungendered. And uh, so some of us, you know, when we write in English, you know, you find ways instead of say, uh, uh, like that little prayer, may God hold you in his hand. I, I, I just couldn't get around that. I'm sure if I thought I can get around it, may go, you know, but I run it quickly. But, but I do when I'm publishing, you know, I'm careful not to use the he. Um, but Amina uses the he and the she. And she uses it interchangeably just to show that that it's, God is not sexed and gendered, and, uh, but our languages are such that, um, you know, they're constricting. Uh, but uh, that, 
is where I, I would come. The other thing that's very interesting about, um, about uh, spouses, you know, husband and wife, um, in the Quran, it's zawj, right? Zawj and zawj, and you know, uh, God created zawjain, you know, two, because in Arabic you have the dual. You have a singular, a dual, and a plural. So he created the dual, Zhao Jane, you know, that you may be happy with each other and this sort of thing. But, uh, and partners, and, but the partners are not gendered. Very interesting. I mean, there's a Zhao and a Zhao, and two Zhaojas are Zhao Jane. And that's what we call husband and wife. And um, it's interesting because, I mean, one of my friends who's kind of, a, well, she's an Islamist and she's, very intelligent and intellectual. And of course, her Arabic is fantastic, minus whatever. Um, and and yani, she talks about a zawja in the Quran, and there is no zawja in the Quran. In other words, there's no female, it's only zawja and zawja. But in the vernaculars, the language is, is um, gendered. And that's just one example, but it's very interesting. And, and what's interesting to me is that if you have partners and they're created for each other and they don't have a gender, doesn't it say that they, they're the same thing? Now, it, yes, there are other passages where um, there, are, there is some gendering, you know, if a woman is giving birth and then certain things must happen and like this balancing of, of work so if a man is, um, must support her or take care of her in that condition because his labor is one kind of labor and her labor is another and that sort of thing. But um, actually, it's, once you get into it, it's very easy to make egalitarian arguments in the Quran. I mean, from using the Quran, it's very easy. And I think it's getting harder to justify the patriarchal versions, quite frankly. And I think these patriarchal folks realize you know, that their, their time, you know, their days are, are limited. Um, so, anyway. Yes? Well, I think um, I like the idea of putting energy in egalitarian arguments um, because these feed into democracy arguments. And uh, the big problem, of course, in most of the Muslim majority societies is these countries, these uh, states and regimes are very repressive and anti and undemocratic and they are using as much as they can religion yani, to you know, perpetuate themselves, but also some of the Islamist movements. I mean, the Islamist movements in terms of gender are not very savory either. But I think that in terms of feminists and progressives, I think the more we develop um, the vocabulary and the activism around the idea of equality and democracy, um, as part of the struggle to topple these folks, because some of the people who want to topple those people, um, you know, at the head of these awful regimes, um, aren't a lot better themselves. And uh, also, uh, you, their divide does not fall on the secular and the religious. It really divide uh, in terms of activists, in terms of patriarchalists. I mean, the worst folks, and I don't suppose anybody from Egypt is here, I mean, you know, spy people, but um, the, uh, yani, the regime in Egypt, the secular regime in Egypt is actually strangling everybody. It's not the religion that's doing it. It's these folks that are doing it. And uh, so I think, and, and we need the secular and we need the, um, uh, the religious arguments. And what is interesting, you mentioned honor crimes. 
Well, you, you are from Turkey. You know more about it than I do. But I know also other places where it's alive and well. I mean, other crimes. And in our parts, their parts, honor crime, they don't, a lot of folks have not said honor crime is Islamic. It's, you know, honor against the name of, you know, the patriarch, the name of the husband, the name of the family, right? It's associated with that. It's very tribal, very tribal. And I've watched, I've watched over here, you know, they try to Islamicize honor crimes. And these folks who kill their wives, for example, and you know, well, it's part of my religion because she did this, and so they want to go to court because they think they can, you know, get off because it's their religion and this sort of thing. But it's very interesting. They really do use, they, they use religious arguments here that I never saw used over there. It was very bizarre. But that's where I think we, uh, we need to, um, to do our work. And the other thing, big thing that's with me now um, uh, is, is, uh, is um, I think that the, um, prog I mean, the progressive Muslim feminist movement um, among these folks, we are, uh, I'm finding things that are very distressful to me. They're getting very identity oriented. And they are acting as gatekeepers for other people. And some of them feel you have to be a Muslim to make arguments, to um, uh, yani agitate for change of uh, Muslim family law. And I never thought that would happen because you know when you get the fundamentalists and you get these right wing whoever's, um, you can deal with them and you don't expect much of them. But when you see it coming from there, it's rather unattractive. And I mean, for example, many of us who are intermarried, we're governed by these laws that people want to change. So you don't have to be a Muslim to be governed by these laws. And so therefore, you don't have to be a Muslim to make the argument. Plus the fact, you don't have to be a Muslim to read the Quran and to develop a discourse. It's not related to what you are. It's related to how you use the materials in the text. And all of us, wherever we're living, we've got to fight these battles together. For example, I'll just end now because I don't want Sister Elizabeth to think that I have overstayed my time in Brooklyn. Um, but, but this question of, of segregation in the Muslim communities, I'm sorry, but I think it's a, it's a problem for all of us. And I don't want segregation in my own country. And I don't care if it comes from whatever religion because it's not necessary by any religion. And I think that um, we have to be in it. And if we want dignity for everyone and, and so on, we have to be in these battles together. And we can't divide according to identity. And I think that's a, a very interesting kind of moment that we have um, entered or that we're into now. So, um, <laughs> Sister Elizabeth is looking very fierce, but she isn't really because she could never look fierce. <laughs> Very, very much, and really, I, from the bottom of my heart, we have to, all of us, as Sister has already done, uh, thank the Khatibs, because really, I mean, it's, it's a very rare opportunity to have this kind of endowment, an opportunity for us to come together and deeply explore things and come together across all kinds of um, experiences. I don't even want to call it lines, and I mean, I really, really, um, I, I've been very uh, grateful and very pleased 
uh, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, so you really deserve all the thanks and love that everybody has been showering on you. And also, I feel I have gained some friends, so that's nice too. Thank you. Just a minute, hold on, Georgie, 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 come say this on the mic. Well, they're all, they're all running away.